Bibles and turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 3 this morning. We're going to look at something a little, a little different today. My heart is full of joy, and yet the spirit is troubled at the same time. You ever have that? Here's, uh, I'm joyful for opportunities that we have to preach the gospel, to witness for the Lord Jesus Christ. Sometimes the Lord is pretty funny about bringing those about. So, uh, as an example, we've been getting to know more of our, our kids' classmates, so in a funny way, one of the parents forgot what car they drove and opened up the car and almost sat on my lap. <laughs> so we got to know somebody else uh, <laughs> in a God-ordained way with a curious look on my face of what? <laughs> uh, it was pretty funny, though. But I'm just joyful. <laughs> I'm just joyful that we have opportunities to do things that other people don't in the name of the Lord. But I'd be lying if to say if the Spirit wasn't troubled over the spiritual state of churches, Christians, our country, things that are going on bigger than that that's in the world. So I want to talk to you this morning about what it really means to, to, to sanctify the Lord and to be able to stand for the Lord in your faith. So as we begin, just join me in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, we just lift up this, this service before you, this time where we open up your word. Father, we want to hear you. Help us hear you. Lord, I just pray this, pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. So I'm going to start, I just want to read a couple verses to you, verses 13 through 17. It says, And who is he who will harm you if you become followers of what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you are blessed. And do not be afraid of their threats, nor be troubled, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you with a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Having a good conscience that when they defame you as evildoers, those who revile your good conduct in Christ may be ashamed. For it is better if it is the will of God to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. And I want to point out the first thing to you right here. Or I, I, Let me ask you a question. If I were to ask you, who the greatest man in the history of the world was, or ever will be, what would be your answer? Jesus. I'm getting attacked by a fly. It's got to be a holy fly. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> I'm being anointed. So, <laughs> uh, so now, if you were to ask you to stand up, come down front, and allow me to put you on trial for your life. Could you defend it? Could you defend your faith? A little harder. It's a little harder to do. And there's a reason I ask you this, because there are things going on in the world that I want you to be aware of this morning. Very particular things that are going on in regards to Christianity. Because there's no question Christianity is under attack, because Jesus is under attack. And there's a few things that are going on. You know, the struggle, <laughs> I think the struggle for us all is, what does God want us to do? What's our personal mission that God wants us to do? I haven't had to really question this for too long. Uh, I really don't like false teaching. And the older I get, the less I like it. <laughs> And the more I want to speak out against it, and this is what we're doing here this morning. I want to point things out without calling out people by name, right? We are not here to tear down the character of men and women. We are here to point out false teaching 
and point out what true teaching is out of Scripture. But here's, I, I heard a quote today, as you know, that there is a big church debate that is going on throughout America. Do you keep the church doors open or do you close them? Is it right for people to gather together and why is it such a big deal that we have to have a court case in California if we can just do things online? Well, if you don't know the answer to that yet, let me enlighten you a little bit. All right, so here's, the, here's what I heard. On the other side of the spectrum, as I have not, <laughs> I haven't failed to make my position known, of we're going to keep church open. We are going to be a light in the community. And you need to understand the, the importance of why this court case that is going on in California carries a heavy weight for the rest of churches all across America. But here's the other side to this this, this discussion. This is what I heard. Jesus himself never commanded Christians to meet. Do you think that's a true statement this morning? Okay. It's a good trick question. Even though you're correct. If we want to speak technically, he did not verbally say in scripture, you are supposed to to meet with those exact words. And therefore, it is taken out of context. Right? And the point is, if Jesus didn't verbally say it, it doesn't really matter. I don't agree. I'm going to tell you why I don't agree with that. And I'm going to tell you why this is so important, because the word says clearly to be ready to give a defense, and this is what we are doing. If the author, the author of the Bible... Is not just the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit acts on whose authority? Right? The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit work together in perfect harmony. So therefore, if all work in perfect harmony, it means Jesus has an act in writing the Word of God. If Jesus is the living Word of God, then it means he is writing the Word of God, or at least combined together with the Father as the Holy Spirit inspires men to perfectly write down word for word in the original language how it was supposed to be written. So therefore, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25, which we have talked about before, which says, do not forsake assembling together, is accurate. But why is it accurate? Because we need strength and encouragement from one another. That's the way God has designed us to be. We're not isolation people. Right? As soon as we become isolationists, we start to depend on our own wisdom and our own counsel, and it quickly leads us astray. We need the strength and encouragement, because the day of Jesus approaches very quickly. May it be today. It would be fantastic. The last day of the church age is at hand. That's what I firmly believe, and I think you need to start looking at things in that fashion as well. It's because the day of Jesus returns from heaven to set foot on the earth. The day the dead are raised from the grave. This day that we are talking about, Jesus renders his final judgment. He establishes his kingdom in its perfect entirety. Because it's going to happen in a blink of an eye, and if you're not ready today... I don't know if you're going to be ready tomorrow. Because we don't know when Jesus is coming back. He's coming quickly. His return is at hand. Or we could look at 1 Corinthians chapter 11 as we did two weeks ago during the Last Supper. Where, where Paul tells us, when you come together, you will partake in the body. When you come together... You will drink the blood. And why do we do this? In remembrance of Jesus. Right? In remembrance of Jesus. We do it together. Or if we look at Acts chapter 2. When the church of God was formed, they continually met daily. Daily. It wasn't just... 
piece by piece, it was daily, or, or more specifically in verses 46 and 47. It says this, so continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, right? Not just at church, outside of church. Because there was no church building, they kind of overtook the temple, which is great. And if there wasn't a temple anywhere close by, they would have sat in a community square and done it right there, right? They ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily to those who were being saved. How does the church grow? God draws people to church because people are honoring to the Father who are already there. Right? It's the sharing of spiritual gifts that stimulate growth for the fellow believer. It's why we come together. Because we don't have all the aspects of every single spiritual gift. I know the ladies are talking about spiritual gifts in their study. We were talking about it Wednesday night. As a pastor, there is this weird expectation that I'm supposed to have all the feelings that everybody has out there. Don't expect that. <laughs> all right. If you want me to cry on command, I will laugh at you. It doesn't mean I don't feel it. This doesn't mean it comes out in the same way. Right? The same way is, if I were to ask you to reason things in your own mind the same way that circles through mine, it's not going to work out that way. But because we put them together, we can accomplish more than when we were apart. It's how God has designed us to be. Of course, Jesus didn't say verbally, word by word, because the church didn't exist yet. We have to understand that. The church didn't exist yet. He was building the foundation, putting the blocks together for all of these things to happen. However, Jesus did say he is building his church in Matthew chapter 16. And he also said in Matthew chapter 18 to take larger problems, larger people problems to the church for the church to help restore fallen brothers and sisters. So if we look at the word church, what does it really mean? It means to gather, to assemble, the convening of believers for worship. Jesus talked about church. He just didn't verbally say word by word, you need to do this. It was already implied. You need to be with your brothers and sisters. This is why we are here every single Sunday, because we need it. If Jesus spoke about the gathering of believers, which he did, by the way, if Jesus is part of the Trinity and the full Godhead uh, wrote the scriptures, then Jesus inspired and authorized the writing of Hebrews, do not forsake the assembly of believers. So for me, the Bible is very clear on this matter, and I hope it will be for you as well. Let me give you a real sharp statement. Failure to recognize this is failure to understand the long-term ramifications it has on you spiritually, us spiritually, and us governmentally. We need to come together so we can learn, so we can grow. My favorite part about this whole last week was the amount of time I had to spend with people from Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Saturday, and leading up to today where we are sharing the Word of God with one another, where we are growing together, sharpening uh, sharpening our, our brothers and sisters. I was filled with joy. But there's a second thing that's going on that really bothers me and has been for quite a while. There are churches who provide certain workshops. Here's the simplicity of this. I'll get into that in the detail. We need to stop fighting over what the Bible says and just believe it with simplicity of a child. It's what God says. Let's just stop arguing about things, right? right? It would be a whole lot easier. But no, this is what we're going to do. We're going to provide people workshops that, and we're going to label it do-it-yourself theology. Right? Do-it-yourself theology. And this is, what we're, this is what the goal is, is to help people develop a concept of God that you can live with. It's all over the place. It's the mental makeup, right? This is how I want God to be, or this is how I want God to please me. That's the whole point of this. I'm going to pick and choose the aspects of God that I like because I can believe in a God that I like, or that I can choose like that. He's not a Lego God. 
You can't build him. He's already there. He is already there. And here's the basic understanding of this theology. There's three things that come with it. Number one, you need to understand what is being taught. This is all false teaching and doctrine, by the way. That's why I'm throwing this out there. The Bible abounds with errors and contradictions. So here's their conclusion. The word of God is downgraded to only guidelines to follow, that it doesn't accurately represent the personhood of Jesus Christ. Therefore, you need more than the word of God. There's a second thing. The traditional definition of God is outdated and it's archaic. God judging people is just plain old mean. He loves everybody equally. There's no distinctions. There won't ever be any judgment because we're all going to heaven. By the way, these are the same things that Paul, Peter, all of the apostles were fighting. But there's a third one that goes with it. And Christianity works more like Islam than it does on how the word of God lays it out. Specifically of this. There's a tripod of authority instead of just God's word. Which, by the way, God calls as his final source of truth. But here it is. Some scripture is relevant for you. There's a great emphasis on passed down traditions. So sometimes traditions are bigger than the word of God. And there is also the last one where people currently reside all around the world. Whatever the current religious consensus is among people has got to be true. This is what's being taught. Why are we in a spiritual decline in the United States of America? Because of this stuff. It's because we've taken the word of God and perverted it into something absolutely that it was never meant to be. There's a man by the name of Harold B. Kuhn who, who sums it up pretty well. It says, modern man has largely ceased to understand himself as a finite being who is part of a cosmos, processing fixed structure and established orders. He insists that existence is prior to essence and concludes that he, as an existing being, is the measure of both reality and truth. Let me give you the summary of that. The world revolves around me. So how I think, how I want it to be, this is what the world is going to be. That's, that's the, the human perspective of, of how this goes. And it is extremely, extremely disturbing to me. These are the things that we're fighting for. This is what I love. I, I mean, I think, I think my biggest, strongest fight next to false teaching is the feel-good Christianity thing. Where we're supposed to make Jesus be attractive. We forget that God draws people. God draws his children. What's he draw them with? The word of God. In its perfect, complete picture. So if you add these together, we find this. The centrality of Jesus in the scriptures is under attack. The deity of Jesus is under attack. The truth of God, the word of God is under attack. The reason for God, the need for God is under attack, and the character of God is under attack in our current culture. In case you're struggling with these thoughts that whether they're happening or not in our country, let me give you some real-time pictures of what have happened in the last couple months. Last week, three people arrested, two given citations at an outdoor worship service in Idaho. I'm not giving you all the details that go with this because they haven't been released to it. So there are factors of why things happen in different levels, and you need to understand that there is a bigger picture here. But three people arrested, two given citations at an outdoor worship event outside of City Hall, five people out of 200. One of them happened to be a Republican candidate. The police were ready and marked out exactly where you were allowed to stand to be able to sing a hymn because the law of social distancing was greater than singing a song in praise to Jesus. 
Now, whether or not these three individuals who were arrested did what they were supposed to or spoke, it's not what the issue actually came to be. It all came to be about Jesus in the end. Because it is okay to arrest somebody who is standing for Jesus, but it's not okay to arrest somebody who is burning down a building. That's what it has come down to. Why do they do that? Because there's no resistance. There's no resistance. Here's the second thing. Twelve Christians, eccentric Christians, by the way, I'm going to add that, were arrested for reading scripture in opposition of a tax bill. Now, whether you agree with these political stances or not, I don't care. It doesn't matter at this point in time. Twelve Christians read, or were arrested for reading scripture in opposition of the, of the tax bill in the Hart Senate office building in what was called an unlawful protest. Never lifted a finger. Stated a handful of things that maybe they shouldn't have said, but were still truthful. Were arrested. I don't know what the unlawful protest section of it was. Earlier this summer, four Christian missionaries were arrested in Dearborn, Michigan. Anybody know what Dearborn, Michigan is? It's the untitled Islam capital, capital of America. Right? They were arrested for peacefully handing out Gospels of John at the Dearborn Arab International Festival. Can't talk about Jesus, but again, you can destroy anything that you want to. Three men were arrested for praying outside of an abortion clinic in North Carolina earlier this year. Not even saying anything. Praying. And currently, we have standards that you cannot worship God together in a building, but you can go anywhere else that you want to. Because there's a greater fear of COVID than there is for the Lord. Is Christianity under attack? I'm just going to say yes. Well, you need to understand what we are facing now is nothing compared to what Africa, the Middle East, and Asia have been facing for years and years and years. And here's what I also believe in a strong fashion. Those Christians there know what it really means to depend on Jesus Christ for everything. They have nothing. We still have everything that we want. And we're getting a taste of who Jesus really is and what it means to stand for the love of our God, for the cross. So why don't we get right down to the truth? I'm going to give you some truth claims. Here's what Jesus has to say, and I want to start off with this, uh, this lady by the name of Rebecca McLaughlin. I mentioned her on Wednesday night. She wrote a book. I forgot to write down the name of the book. But here's what she says which is also what many people have said over the years. It's just stated differently. Jesus claims rule over all of heaven and earth. He presents himself not as one possible path to God, but as God himself. We may choose to disbelieve him, but he cannot be one truth among many. He has not left us that option. Jesus didn't say, here, you can figure it out. He said, I am the option. Right? Specifically, John 14, 6, the famous, famous verse. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Or, if we want to look in, in even in greater detail in John chapter 10, 27 through 30, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. Jesus is God. The Apostle Paul, as was read earlier this morning by Mary Lou, goes on to, to further explain why Jesus didn't leave us with another option. In simple terms, because there isn't one. There wasn't anybody else who could do what Jesus Christ did for the entire world in one act. Philippians 2, verses 5 through 11. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, 
but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of a cross. Therefore God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. It does not make it any clearer than that right there. Jesus did something that we couldn't do because he is God. Fully God, fully man, and still made himself of no reputation to make the cross, which was the most humiliating way to die at the time, become a symbol for the entire world. That is our God. This is what we have when we are reading through, through, the, through this lens in 1 Peter 3. We need to make sure that you know what cause it is that you are fighting for. You need to know. It's got to be a godly cause. Not because I want to fight for it. It's because it gives honor to God in every step of the way. But the second thing that comes with that is right there in verse 15. Well, let me read 14 for you. It says, But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you are blessed. And do not be afraid of their threats, nor be troubled. We don't have to worry about the threats of people. We may suffer under the hand of it, but it is nothing compared to, the, to, to sitting before the king. But he gives us a second thing in 15. It says, Sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. Set the Lord God above everything else. Right? That's where, he, that, that's where he sits already. That's where he needs to be in our personal life. We must do this. And I'm going to tell you this. If two doesn't work for you, one and three never will. To the points I'm going to tell you. Right? Your cause will never be just. And number three you need to be ready to give a defense. You will never be able to give a defense if God does not sit where he's supposed to in your heart. I learned this the hard way in my naive years. 19 years old, fresh out of college, had a job, was working with a gentleman was in his late 50s, early 60s, who was a, a devout atheist and uh, living a different style, lifestyle. Asked me a simple question. I remember it very clearly, still to this day. The purpose was not to learn or hear an answer. The purpose was to destroy a 19-year-old young man. Asked me a question. What were Christians called before Jesus Christ came? I didn't get more than a sentence out in my explanation of what they were called before I was torn up and down for the next several minutes. Left with nothing to say. Didn't understand at 19 years old what it meant to give a defense. Or what it meant to try to give a defense and still stand strong. Who is Jesus to you? Is Jesus everything? How would you describe him in your greatest aspects of your life? How would you describe him in your lowest aspects of your life? How would you describe Jesus, period? I want to read to you one of the speeches. There's a, there's a movie called Because of Gracia. It's, uh, it's some high school kids that are trying to figure out who Jesus is to them in a world that asks them to do everything against biblical standards. And there's a young man who comes to this, this realization and he answers the question that I asked you before, who the greatest man in the world is. And it became personal for him. And this is how he described Jesus. He didn't fight to settle the score. He fought for the poor. He went to parts of the city rich wouldn't even dare think about 
He cured leprosy when it was considered sin to touch a leper. He saved the prostitutes when the religious men were saying, kill her. He promoted love above all when his kinfolk were itching to attack. And he continued to promote love when his best friend stabbed him in the back. He continued to have hope when people he came to save spit in his face. And he continued to forgive when his blood dripped down the cross's base. But when I say Jesus, you see the chain links formed around yourself for protection, but your fence is weak because so are the connections. The overwhelming historical weight of Jesus' existence is not what makes me have this insistence. See, I believe Jesus is the greatest man who ever lived because when my depression was choking me, Gandhi was not the one to show me love. When I was drowning in my own perfections, it was Jesus that brought me up out of that pit. See, I knew what brokenness sounded like to the hopeless. It sounded like a piano with all of its strings ripped out of it, still looking perfect on the outside to all of its admirers, but knowing the sound of its music would never measure up the symphony of perfection. But that's when this carpenter named Jesus came into my life. He took this dead heart of nature and made it so much more alive. See, we all form chain links around ourselves for protection. But the reason as to why there is no question as to who the greatest man in the world is, is because I see this connection. It's this beautiful silver piano chord playing between me and my Lord. And it's making the most beautiful melody that the world has ever heard. And it's a melody that Jesus offers to the entire world. Because when I hear Jesus, I hear rhythm, healer, harmony, betrayed, timpani, murder, melody, alive. Is that how you see your God this morning? Is that how you depict Jesus Christ in your description of people? See, what makes this so passionate and powerful for me is that it's just genuine of what he believes. He didn't try to define every single aspect of the Bible. He, he, he defined exactly what it was that Jesus did for him. That's how we defend our faith. That is what it means to give a defense to everyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. But it tells us to do it with two things, with meekness and with fear. To put it another way, with a gentle humility, knowing that I fear God above man, knowing that I love God above people. What is it? for us to be able to stand in front of somebody who is yelling at us, telling us that what we believe is absolutely ridiculous and has no place in our current society. Can we do it by responding with gentle humility because we fear God above everybody else? It's tough. I don't know about you, but when I get yelled at, my first thought is not gentleness. Right? The picture that forms my mind is not one of love. It might be strangling. I, I don't know. It's, but, but then we look at the picture of Jesus. And what did Jesus do that we talked about last week when he was being accused? Judge this woman. He said nothing. He just wrote in the sand and said, if you are without sin, feel free to do so. And they couldn't. They couldn't, because that is what it means in the next verse. Having a good conscience, that when they defame you as evildoers, those who revile your good conduct in Christ may be ashamed. It does not mean that you will not face punishment or suffering or lack of something here on this earth. It means when they stand before God, it will testify against them. Now right now, what is also very troubling is that for some of you who have heard this, uh, Ravi Zacharias is currently under, under attack for sexual misconduct. I don't know the truth. Right? There's, there's an investigation that is going on. We are not going to jump to any conclusion 
That is not what we are here for, but we are praying that good conduct proves what is right. I am bothered by the fact that people wait until after someone is dead. But it's also the enemy's number one tool. You discredit somebody when they can't speak for themselves. Again, our prayer is that this, there's no truth in these things. Because God is going to prove what is real and prove what is right. But it should point out very clearly to us, your life is going to be used against you. If you stand for Jesus Christ, your life is going to be used against you. If there are things that are brought out that you already have asked God for forgiveness for, don't be afraid to admit to them. You know what you once did? Yes, I do. And I know what Jesus Christ saved me from. I am no longer this man or woman. Do you know what you once did? This is what Satan's going to do at the throne of God. But we have an advocate in the name of Jesus Christ that does not allow that to happen. They are mine. They are mine. So if I were to ask you, how would you accurately describe Jesus in your life this morning? Could you do it? It doesn't need to be poetic. Truth is already poetic in itself. Some people have the gift. I want to share this with you. As I challenge you, as I challenge you today, The time is coming to where your faith is going to be proved real at a greater level. Be ready to give the defense today and not tomorrow. Be ready today. Be ready to describe what Jesus is to you, who Jesus is to you, what the Lord has saved you from and given you instead. There's a man by the name of Isaac Wimberly. It was described this in a, in a manner, in a poetic form, that I, one of the best that I have ever heard. I'm going to attempt to do this justice. But as you listen to this, just think about the magnificence of God in your life. He says this. If there are words for him, then I don't have them. You see, my brain has not yet reached a point where it could form a thought that could adequately describe the greatness of my God. And my lungs have not yet developed the ability to release a breath with enough agility to breathe out the greatness of his love. And my voice, my voice is so inhibited, restrained by human limits, that it's hard to even send a praise up. You see, if there are words for him, then I don't have them. My God. His grace is remarkable. Mercies are innumerable. Strength is impenetrable. He is honorable, accountable, and favorable. Unsearchable yet knowable. Indefinable yet approachable. Indescribable yet personal. He is, behind, he is beyond comprehension. Further than imagination. Constant through generations. King of every nation. But if there are words for him, then I don't have them. You see, my words are few, and to try and capture the one true God using my vocabulary will never do. But I use my words as an expression, an expression of worship to a Savior, a Savior who is both worthy and deserving of my praise. So I use words. My heart extols the Lord, blesses his name forever. He has won my heart, captured my mind, and has bound them both together. He has defeated me in my rebellion, conquered me in my sin. He has welcomed me into his presence, and he completely invited me in. He has made himself the object of my sight, flooding me with mercies in the morning and drowning me with grace in the night. But if there are words for him, I don't have them. But what I do have is good news. For my God knew that man-made words would never do. For words are just tools that we use to, the point, to point to the truth. So he sent his son, Jesus Christ, the word as living proof. 
He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, giving nothingness formation. And by his word he sustains in the power of his name, for he is before all things, and over all things he reigns. Holy, holy is his name. Praise him for his life, the way he preserved in, or persevered in strife, the humble son of God becoming the perfect sacrifice. Praise him for his death, that he willingly stood in our place, that he lovingly endured the grave, that he battled our enemy and on the third day rose in victory. Praise him because he rose. Hallelujah, he rose. He is everything that was promised. Praise him as the risen king. Lift your voice and sing. For one day he will return for us and we will finally be united with our Savior for eternity. So it's not just words that I proclaim. For my words point to the word. And the word has a name. Hope has a name. Joy has a name. Peace has a name. Love has a name. And that name is Jesus Christ. Praise his name forever. I pray that this is your heart today. Wherever God takes you, that you would be passionate about your defense, whether it is loud, whether it is quiet, whether you are standing, whether you are kneeling, that you are able to give a defense of why Jesus rescued you. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for Jesus Christ. Father, I thank you for people who have come before us that put to words things that we think and have yet trouble to describe. Lord, I want to thank you that our king sits at your right hand, discerning what we cannot speak, that the Holy Spirit is at work in our hearts. Father, may we be sensitive to it today. Lord, there are many false doctrines. There are many teachings that are going around. There are many of these workshops or so-called philosophies that say you can choose who you want your God to be, that's called an idol. Lord, we don't want that. We want to see you in its entirety. We want our life to be transformed to you, not your life to be transformed to us, Father. That would make you less than God. We want you to be fully God. Exactly who you are. But in order to stand strong, we need courageous faith. And when we are weak, we need our brothers and sisters to come alongside and help us stand. We need great prayer. Father, I want to thank you that Jesus did all of those things for us today and is still fighting every battle that we fight today in our heart. And ultimately wins the victory, Lord. And may we, when that day comes, when you collect us as your children, Rejoice greatly, lifting up the name of our King, Jesus Christ. Lord, let us not wait for that day as well, but let us do it now, because people need to see who our Savior is, who the Savior of the world is, that he died on the cross for our sins, that he rose from the grave to defeat death, and that he was the first one into heaven to give us eternal life an inheritance that we did not deserve, but he richly gave us freely as we are part of God's family. Father, thank you for that grace today. Thank you for Jesus. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 Well, I just encourage you to continue to lift the name of Jesus if you choose to stay with us for some coffee and some snacks. Thank you for worshiping with us today. May Jesus come alive like you have never seen him before in your own life. Have a great day.